What are the secrets of this new ancient city found in Ecuador? Well, there are 6,000 structures, like uh, bases for homes and structures and things that were found in Ecuador recently. And it's been found to be as old as Greece, so about two and a half thousand years old. And this area is a part of the a part of the Amazon basin. So it's Ecuador, but it's part of the Amazon basin. We'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but coming up uh, today on the show, we'll be also talking about tortoises that are being returned to the Galapagos, a new T-Rex species which was found, a uh, butterfly restoration project that's really big scale happening in California, and an endangered gorilla which was born in the London Zoo. This is Eco Show. Hello and welcome to Eco Show. This is a show about ecology, the environment, and things generally related to that. I'm Henry. Thanks for checking out the show. So these ancient cities were found by um, LIDAR, which is a laser technology for looking at elevation changes. And so it's been used to find this other really big city in Ecuador. It's in Ecuador's Upano, Upano Valley, and it's east of the Andes. So it's in this Amazon River Basin area. As we already said, 6,000 earthen platforms, and it's across an area of 100 square miles. And they've uh, currently divided it up into 16 little towns or settlements. And this had very wide and sophisticated roads to connect these. A lot of them were dug into the ground as well, which is sort of interesting. Um, And so there's been a bunch of findings like this lately that have not been possible without this technology. Um, And they're saying that this area may have once, well, the Amazon basin in general may have supported millions of people. So it was sort of like a myth before that a lot of people lived in the Amazon, but now it's very clear that this was a a really developed area. There's not a whole lot known about the uh, the people that lived there two and a half thousand years ago, but they'll definitely be doing surely more archaeological sorts of digs in the area to understand them better. But uh, they had agrarian terraces, drainage ditches. And probably grew maize and potato. So that kind of um, gives us a base idea. And so we've got this image here from which is showing the LIDAR, which uh, just kind of gives you a, an over idea, an idea of the distribution of these. You can see how the platforms are sort of um, laid out. You can see where the terraces are. And you can just get an example um, on the right of what this LIDAR does to to show you all these structures. Okay, tortoise returns. So tortoise are being returned to an island in the Galapagos. 136 juvenile tortoise have been airlifted to Isabela Island, and this is their only natural habitat. The ones that were put there are between ages of five and nine years old and without helicopters they would have had to take them so they put them over there with helicopters and if they didn't have those they'd have to use boats and it'd be kind of a mess Um, and they'd have to carry them on their shoulders as well so they were quarantined dewormed analyzed for health and put over there they help keep balance on the island they're really important because they distribute seeds and Part of the big reasons that they've been able to reintroduce them is by eradicating rats off of the island. So the rats will eat eggs and things like that and make it hard for a lot of animals to reproduce. And uh, and I wanted a little bit of background on the on the Galapagos tortoise tortoises, so I hope you do too. Uh, so they can get up to 417 kg 
were 919 pounds and they can live over 100 years. They're big and old. And they went from about, they estimated the population on the islands was about 250,000 on these islands in the 16th century to just 15,000 in the 1970s. Um, This is because there weren't other humans living on there, to our best knowledge. Um, Well, there definitely, there weren't for a long time before the Spaniards came, um, but there definitely weren't any humans on the island when the Spaniards came and then they used to, they ate them, they used them for, for oil. Then there was a lot of habitat clearance, introduction of non-native animals, so they really got knocked down a huge amount after humans came there. And tortoises on three of the Galapagos Islands have gone extinct because of uh, humans, particularly those European folks that came over. Um, And today, so in the 70s, we're down to 15,000, and today we're up to 19 thousand across the islands uh a crazy thing is that they're thought to have reached the islands by floating and this is because um they have sort of a relative that's on mainland south america and they can go for months without food or fresh water and they're very buoyant and they can lift their um lift their heads above water and there's currents that go in that direction so i was thinking that maybe it would have been humans that brought them there originally as like a food source or something. But from what I could read, there, read there's really pretty little to no evidence that there were humans on uh, on the Galapagos Islands, which is curious because there were folks living out in uh, in the islands out those ways. But anyways, that's sort of the story at the moment with that, <laughs> and it's. Uh, And it's corroborated, that idea is sort of like backed up because it's believed that tortoises reached South America from Africa in the same way 20 million years ago. Um, And actually those tortoises may have even, I was looking for the dates, but I couldn't quite find like how long ago they got to the Galapagos Islands, but it may have been millions of years ago so it may have been before humans were even in south america would have to double check that but anyways yeah they thought that tortoises got to south america in the same way by just floating across um from africa okay our new t-rex species there's a new newly discovered dinosaur that may be the closest related species to t-rex and it's kind of causing ripples in the dinosaur community a little bit or I imagine it would um it lived in the in North America for 5 million years before T-Rex they're calling it Tyrannosaurus macraensis imagine there's a macrae guy who found it that they just named it after boring but respect to macrae for finding it (laughs) Uh, I wouldn't want a thing named after me. Give it a cool name. Don't name a dinosaur after me. Name it after something badass. Um, And so they found, they are saying that they found this proof from examining a skull. So there was a, a, uh, some fossils that were identified as being from a T-Rex. And now they're saying that um, they looked back over this and there's some subtle differences that they say make it a unique species. Um, and the big thing that is coming from this is that because it was there 5 million years before T-Rex, there was sort of a question of whether the Tyrannosaurus species came over from Asia or if it was based in North America. And so this, uh, for some would solidify the idea that Tyrannosaurus developed in North America. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of debate around that, especially when they're just kind of, um, saying this just from one fossil, but it would be cool to be in that community at this time. If you're, if you're a T-Rex fan, um, very interesting things going on there. And that's about that.
so uh other curious creatures we've uh well we'll do a quick pause if you want to um get more involved with the show we've got i've got an instagram which will connect to the pages for this podcast and the other podcast i do which is called beach dogs beach dogs isn't about anything at the moment it's just a stream of consciousness and uh it's a good show if you don't speak English and like the sound of my voice is pretty much uh, that's the value input of that show at the moment. So you can check that out if you like. That'll be on the YouTube channel. Um, this is also a podcast. So wherever podcast spots are at, if you're looking for it and having trouble finding it, the uh, there's a link through the Instagram page. Okay, back to the show. So a whole bunch of butterflies were released, and this is part of a plan to help return Baron's Silver Spot Butterfly. There's a $1.5 million grant to the Mendocino Land Trust over in California, and they're going to plant 35,000 early blue violets, which is a plant that the caterpillars of this uh, butterfly rely on. And they will plant supporting native plants as well. So there's a lot of native planting restoration going in to make habitat for these butterflies. And uh, so these plants, the native plants, have decreased due to invasive grasses in the area. So this restoration will be really helpful to bring things back. Uh, Restoration will cover 53 acres. So it's a really big project. And they're going to release a whole bunch of caterpillars. They've got over a thousand caterpillars ready to be released. This grant lasts for four years. And the butterfly has only been sighted 92 times in 15 years. So butterflies are an important food source for other animals. I think they do a bit of pollinating and things like that. They're also very pretty. And, uh, and add complexity to food webs so always a good thing to keep our biodiversity up so that's very cool and there was a uh, endangered critically endangered western lowland gorilla born in the london zoo so the mother's name mjuku gave and she gave birth for the second time on january 17th after an eight and a half month pregnancy and a 17 minute labor labor this is good news because these uh these are critically endangered and it was fathered by a gorilla brought in in 2022 as part of a breeding program they don't know the sex yet because it's still being held closely by their mother and they're not gonna try and take it away so a little background on the western lowland gorilla because i didn't know much about them but uh, was seeing that they're critically endangered. They're saying in this article, it's the smallest subspecies of gorilla, but it's still very strong, and they are herbivorous. They're and as they get older, I think the males in particular will get um, they'll go gray, and so that's why they call them the silverbacks. And the issue that's threatening them is that they're hunted for meat, and logging destroys their habitat they're important because they're herbivorous and they distribute seeds across the the landscape there's about 150 to 250 thousand left which is a lot more than i expected for something that was critically endangered but their populations are decreasing rapidly and so that that kind of draws in the question for me because i think these zoos do have an important place for maintaining genetic diversity of species when they're getting to really low levels. But I don't know, 150 to 250,000 left. I'm skeptical about if the resources being uh, put into a breeding program and having them in zoos is actually... Uh, where that money could be best spent, you know, because it takes it's expensive to to keep the gorillas and to uh, to do these sort of breeding programs and everything like that. And for some 
some species there are really low number numbers and it's important to do this but i don't know about 150,000 to 250,000 i don't know if that really uh justifies having a whole breeding program but but anyways that's what they're doing and uh and there was that cute photo of of the gorilla so it's nice to have that and uh and that's it so thanks for checking out eco show this week hope you're having a great week and we'll catch you next time bye bye <laughs>